Hello everyone, I'm Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Midwifery Business Consultation. This presentation is about understanding your state and national birth center regulations. A legal disclaimer we put at the beginning of all of our presentations. This information is for general and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to substitute for professional clinical clinical or legal advice. We strive to keep our information as accurate as possible, but make no claims, guarantees, or promises of the accuracy. Regulations change. Uh, every midwife has different scope of practice, different licensure, so you need to know your local area. These are just recommendations based on a general guide. Course objectives. The students will be able to verbalize exactly the different types of state regulations for birth centers. They'll be able to verbalize what exactly is the American Association of Birth Centers, what exactly is the Commission for the Accreditation of Birth Centers. They'll be able to verbalize the CABC accreditation process, requirements, and um, how, what difference is state versus national licensure and certification. They'll be able to talk about the accreditation process and compare the pros and cons of having state regulations and not having state regulations for birth centers. So why is this topic important? If there's any midwife considering starting a birth center in their local town, you need to understand the different regulations, the state regulations, the national certification process, um, the benefits of having each, the pros and cons. Um, you really would want to understand when you're doing your business planning, what is a birth center, what are the quality measures, what are the standards of care, what are the expectations, on a national and local level. Um, there's different agencies for hospitals. There's JCO and for birth centers, there's CABC. And so we're going to be talking about how important it is to get more birth centers, improve the quality of care, get the state regulations, um, the licensure, if they're applicable in your state and getting the national certification and the benefits it has to your practice, short-term, long-term. So the whole point is to support, we need more birth centers terribly, and I want to make sure that we're making as many resources and tools and templates for midwives to have successful startup birth centers. So what exactly are state regulations? Every state is different. Some states don't have any. Some states are super restrictive. Um, sometimes they're part of an independent regulatory body. Sometimes they're grouped with other regulations. In every state, it's interesting. Kansas, they're grouped with daycares. Um, most of them are grouped with medical centers, sometimes surgical centers, sometimes um, hospital medical practices. So you have to know your birth center regulations. It's pretty easy to Google search it's pretty easy to go to AABC, the American Association of Birth Centers. They have a lot of great resources telling you your state specific regulations and then you can dig into the actual state board regulations very thoroughly, the application process, the fees, the requirements, the criteria, because don't make assumptions that the national certification indicators, guidelines, are going to be more or less than what your state requires. Just like with midwifery regulations, we've got 50 different states, multiple um, educational pathways for midwives. It's similar to birth centers. So this is from AABC, and it's the most up-to-date from 2019. So there are a few states, two, four, six, eight, nine states currently that do not have birth center regulations, and we'll talk about the pros and cons of not having birth center regulations. Um, there's three states that have them under other boards and other um, sectors of reference points. Um, so most of it, 80-85% of the United States has birth center regulations in some shape or form. Some are more restrictive, some are more um, pro midwifery friendly. I always tell people if you go to the AABC birth center map locator and you can see if there's more birth centers in a state, it typically is more midwifery friendly with autonomous practice and it's better birth center regulations. If you don't see much for birth centers, it's not that there's not a need there. It tends to have restrictive regulations or no regulations that sometimes make it difficult to be the first in your state to get going. 
So what is exactly the American Association of Birth Centers? It was started in the 1980s. It's an excellent resource for anybody considering starting a birth center. Um, they set the national standards of quality measures, scope, services, what is the definition, philosophy, mission of birth centers. So consumers and insurance companies and collaborating physicians and healthcare systems have a stamp of approval, a seal of this is the standard of what birth centers are. CABC, the Commission of Accrediting Birth Center, is the one that'll directly give you the national certification. Um, but AABC is more the, they support each other and work closely together to give you the resources, the workshops, the tools, the templates to make a successful birth center. So CABC is more of the standards of care, the quality measures, the indicators there that you can get renewed yearly. You can choose every three years. You can get accredited while you're opening your birth center. You could get accredited once it's established. There's different levels of accreditation um, and review process. It takes an average three to six months to do the CABC accreditation. It really depends on how prepared you are. Um, there's a lot of documentation, policies, quality measures, paperwork, review processes you have to have in place for your birth center. Um, so I've helped numerous birth centers get going, get accredited, um, and there's very key things. There's over a 200 page document. CABC tells you very specifically what we're going to look at to see if you have them present at your birth center if you want this national certification. So it's the only current birth center accrediting body in the United States. It's an independent, not for profit, um, freestanding birth center organization that supports getting national standards, national legislature, state advocacy, helping to get recognition for freestanding birth centers across the country. So these are the two big things. If you're ever considering starting a birth center, um, you really want to get to know them well in the United States. You want to know the standards, the expectations, the indicators, what CABC and AABC are offering for resources and support during the process. The price ranges greatly for the accreditation process. It could be $3,000 all the way up to $20,000, $25,000, depending on how long and how involved, because it's not just their accreditation process and the fees and, sh and flying them out. It's also if you're doing business consultants, if you're hiring people to make your policies, procedures for you. So the price can vary greatly for this accreditation process, depending on how much you have ready and how long you want to accredit for. So the whole point of having national and state regulations is to ensure quality, is to have an accountability, a basic standard expectation. If you see a midwife, you know once they get their CPM certification, they get their CNM, CM certification, you have a basic baseline of what they've been trained. And that's similar to birth centers. With state regulation, state licensure, and with national certification, consumers and the healthcare system and legislature have a baseline understanding of the quality, the standards, the services that are being offered at that facility. It's a very comprehensive process to become accredited. A lot of people I encourage you hire a specialist. Midwifery Business Consultation helps people with this process. There's a lot of great consultants out there and people have went through the birth center accreditation process that you should reach out to to help save you time and money, whether it's replicating their policies, protocols, resources, or being that mentorship because there's a week of on-site um, multi-day visits and they're going to review things, they're going to ask for statistics, and they're going to ask for a bunch of things that are very compliant indicator evaluations to make sure you're following the evidence, you're collaborating. Um, some states do require written supervisory relationships with midwives. Some birth center state regulations require PEDS, hospitals, OBs to have written collaboration um, transport protocols that both people parties agree with. Um, the national certification process only requires a medical director that's a physician that um, can help with administration. They don't have to be the collaborating physician. So I always stress that to people that don't get confused what the state requires versus what the national CABC accreditations require. So you need to know both really well. Some states require you to get CABC accredited on top of having the state licensure. Some states will count the CABC 
CDC accreditation as part of your application process to um, to replicate and say, yep, I, I followed national standards. Here's the application. Here's the fee. Um, some states will make you just have the state regulations. You don't even have to have the national certification. And we'll talk about the pros and cons of having a state license versus having this national certification on top. So the key indicators of compliance, you're going to want to look at the philosophy of your practice, the mission, the scope of practice, all the different providers. If you've got physicians, you've got midwives, you've got nurse practitioners. Um, what is this chain of command, the planning process? How often do you guys have meetings? Um, how do you follow up with meeting minutes, agendas, quality measures? What is the strategic plan, the financial projections? You want to have a human resource department with hiring and firing and the proper documentation of bringing new staff on and training them um, the facility the safety it's not just the birth rooms it's the um, fire extinguishers it's the uh, plans in your area for natural disasters and how you're going to handle emergency situations if the power goes out what's your backup plan um, what services do you offer what supplies do you have on site do you do nitrous oxide do you have an emergency cart do you have a, a newborn transport because Indiana and some states do require certain additional equipment versus the national standards um, where do you keep the health records how are you staying HIPAA compliant how are you protecting um, the staff and the consumers alike with the long-term record storage um, what research are you part of do you have students are you part of statistics and data does your clients aware that there's students and that there's research occurring on site there's very detailed indicators they put through for quality measures if there's near misses the evaluation process for staff uh, testimonials, evaluation, six weeks postpartum, and what are you doing about concerns and complaints that are happening at the practice. So there's a very comprehensive process. It's not just um, taking care of pregnant women and catching babies in a beautiful birth center. There's a very extensive business operational aspect uh, that any business should have. They're just showing step by step that it's accountable and in place. So there's a lot of great resources A, B, C, and C, A, B, C provide. They do workshops, they can do in person, they can do online support, they can do mentoring, consulting, they can do, um, there's private groups for the membership um, levels. There's a lot of great resources not just for getting the birth center going but maintaining it successfully keeping up with insurance trends keeping up with um, evidence and what other people are seeing in their area ideas brainstorming how to hire new staff when everybody nationally has having a midwife shortage and they're all having trouble finding there's different creative ways that the midwives support each other part of this membership these resources um, so that we can have like-minded birth center directors helping solve problems together versus each one trying to do it in their local area. So the other things that the birth center CABC and ABC do, they can give you sample tools and templates, they can give you um, the the resources, the evaluation, some of these things, and then some of it you have to ask for your colleagues, some of it you can go to midwifery business consultation, you could make yourself, um, but you definitely have to have very key things that are required to make sure that your birth center gets state licensure and gets the national certification. So the big perks with CABC, if you're in a state where there's no regulations, getting the national accreditation really helps you to utilize as that um, insurance contracting, being professional, the stamp of approval. If birth centers are new in your area, it's it's hard to show what is a birth center because our culture is so conditioned that a labor and delivery unit is a birth center. And so when you're doing something new, giving them a national certification stamp of approval from CABC really gives the consumers, gives the um, the zoning commission, the people in the community that this meets basic national standards um, with the care that you're providing. So it's really, it helps with collaboration, it helps with long-term um, success of the practice, reducing risk, liability, lawsuits, a lot of perks to having that national certification, whether the state requires it or not. 
So the difference between state regulations and accreditation, state regulations, obviously there's 50 different states you saw from the map. Um, there's some states that don't even have licensure. Um, there's some states that are more restrictive than the CABC and AABC standards. And there's some that just say, get the national certification, accreditation, and, and then just fill out this application. So every state is completely different and what they expect out of you. Some states require you to have just the state licensure, but you don't have to have the national certification certification accreditation seal. Some states require both. Um, and then if there's no state licensure, it's really if you want to try to do insurance, you want to show to the consumers that you meet this national standard. Um, some midwives will choose not to, some won't just based on um, their overhead budgets and their goals for their practice long term. So it's really interesting because state legislature, depending on who passes it, what it's linked with, um, some of the states require cert certificates of need, like in New York, and it's really hard because you're being put against a medical board that's your competitors. They don't want you to open. And so there are states some states have very restrictive options to be able to get a birth center going there. And so as you're doing your business planning, that is your time to save your time and money to say, okay, this state, I have to have a written agreement with a hospital, a pediatrician, an OB, I need a certificate of need. The application process is way more restrictive than the state across from me. I live close to the border. Um, maybe you wanna move. Maybe you want to do the birth center on the other side of the state lines if you live close close to two. So there's pros and cons of um, thinking you have 50 different states you can choose from. Some are better than others. Some reimbursement are better than others. Um, but when you get state licensure, you can get facility fee reimbursement from the insurance companies. With CABC accreditation, sometimes you can use that national licensure number to negotiate with insurance companies. And sometimes they'll say, no, nope, it's not licensed in your state. This doesn't count. So the pros and cons of state regulations, we've already hinted at them. If there's no regulations for midwives, for birth centers, anybody can call themselves a midwife, anybody can call themselves a birth center. And so it muddies the water to consumers of what is a freestanding birth center, what is a midwife, what is the philosophy of care, what are the standards, um, how are we holding accountable if there is a concern, a quality measure issue? Um, what board do we go to to do a complaint, to do a follow-up, to have a quality measure review process in place? So I am in support of birth center regulations if they give midwives and birth centers full autonomy of their scope and practice. If birth center regulations start costing a lot more overhead, there's extra paperwork, there's extra requirements that aren't really about safety, there's a lot of extra needs for equipment that are needed in a hospital, but now they're requiring them in the birth center that many of the midwives just can't afford or it doesn't make the business model cost effective. Um, if they're requiring a certificate of need and they're requiring a written collaboration to be able to open your practice, it makes a lot of barriers for midwives to be successful. Um, the, there's evidence shows over and over again, these written supervisory relationships and these certificate of needs are not improving outcomes. They're just making less midwives and less birth centers available to the communities. So the CABC process, um, it can range between three to six months, depending on where you're at. You could take a year, year and a half of planning um, and doing workshops, depending on where you are. If you're building, you're redoing a space that you're leasing, you bought a building, you're doing construction. Um, more of the timeline with the actual build and the renovation of the birth center can fluctuate greatly, but with the CABC process of them actually coming on site, them reviewing all your documents, they do a lot of it from a distance, and it's a really neat process. You get access to an online portal, you download your things, they look through it, they ask questions. Um, depending on if you're new or established will make a difference of what level of paperwork because obviously if you're a brand new practice you're not going to have statistics so they give you more of like a temporary new um, startup uh, licensure certification and then you have to give them in six months to a year some of the statistics and outcomes. You're watched a little bit closer once you are 
a newer practice getting going, which makes a lot of sense for support. And then if you're established, you have a history of taking care of people already having systems in place, quality statistics, things to show your outcomes and how the practice is going to be running. So um, it's more of a lot of paperwork. I definitely think you need to have somebody for two to six months that's part time to full time just strictly designated to this. They're making your policies, they're making your documents, they're going through the CABC indicator step by step and making sure you have all those things available so when they ask for it, um, they can check it off their list that you meet those standards. So it's a great way they look at all your birth center clinical and administration policies. They look at your business practices. They may ask to look at your mission, your financial projections, who are the business partners, what's the chain of command, what if all of a sudden, uh, like especially business operating agreements, if uh, they want to know you're going to be successful and continue to care for the community for years to come. So they want to know you've got a strong business structure. They're going to review personal files to make sure that everybody has the certifications and credentials they're supposed to do the midwives, the NPs, the RNs, the physicians, the um, also NRP, BLS, all those key certifications that are really important to have for improved quality. They're going to look at your policies, particularly the risk out criteria, the transfer protocols, the times where the the highest risk of infant and maternal morbidity and mortality can occur. They want to make sure that the midwives are following the scope of practice based on their certification and the state licensure. They want to make sure that you're independently caring for appropriate people, you're collaborating. Even if you have informal relationships, they're going to want to know who do you talk to if you need additional support outside of the midwifery um, care what if you have to do a transfer what's the is there a hospital within 30 minutes of the birth center? That's one of the key indicators um, that has labor and delivery services. That may not be your primary transport place, but in an emergency situation and minutes matter, they're going to want to make sure that you do have somewhere with a higher acuity access for the birth center. So it's a lot of risk management, a lot of quality measures, a lot of detailed chart reviews of how do you document what EHR system, are you being HIPAA compliant, are you following JCO, CLIA, all these um, organizations and the standards that they have in place, what's your cleaning process, how do you do laundry, how do you um, do your consults for when they're considering being a patient of the birth center, um, how do you, what services do you offer, do you just do OB or do you do maternity care, do you accept insurance, are you cash, um, do your policy policies discriminate? Are there culturally sensitive education for the staff? They're going to look at all those things to make sure that you're fitting that national standards for birth centers. So they're going to look if you've already got statistics at um, what has happened in the past and the quality measures. Um, they're going to come on site and see the facility with COVID. Um, they were doing more virtual. Um, so sometimes they're now giving the choice of being on site and virtual. Um, it will save a little bit of the transportation hotel um, expenses for the CABC reviewers. Um, but they're going to look to see is the facility clean? Is there a, a large enough, wide enough hallway for EMS to come? through? Um, is there a clear separation of the clinic and the birth center? Is there a family waiting room? Is there a staff break room? Is there an education room for the staff and for the um, consumers? Is there a lot of resources that you advocate? Do you, how do you approach the first visit all the way to six weeks postpartum? Um, what is the bathrooms look like? Are you handicapped accessible? Um, what is the safety? Are there cords? Are there electrical issues? Um, is it not heat? Is it not cooling? Is it is it safe and comfortable for people to be visiting your facility? So you, they're going to ask staff. They're going to ask collaborating physicians. They're going to ask hospital personnel. They're going to ask key people that interact with the birth center how the relationship has been. Are there any concerns? What do you love about the place? What are areas of improvement? They're going to really look closely and then the review panel will look at all the documents, we'll look at all the, the people that come on site and review everything's recommendations to make a final decision if the national accreditation through CABC will be given to that birth center. 
So as a conclusion, I just want to stress to people, if you're ever considering opening a birth center, AABC and CABC are going to be high level essential resources for you to thoroughly be involved in as a member, attending workshops, resources, being part of their um, membership forums, talking with their staff. They are the national committee of the standards that we want to set in the United States. Um, they, every state has different regulations, so you really need to know your local area and places you're thinking about starting a birth center, the pros and cons, are you willing to move, are you on state lines, um, there's a lot of things. Talk to other midwives and birth centers in your area. Get a sense of why are they CABC accredited, why are they not CABC accredited. Um, if there's state licensure, what are some things that you guys could support each other so you don't have to rework the wheel. They've already done the accreditation, they've already done the state license. Um, you could pay for their mentorship, you could pay because they know your local area. Midwifery Business Consultation has national guidelines and tools and templates and resources, but it's always nice to also talk to your local community midwives, particularly the ones already running successful birth centers in your state. So there's a lot of potential the next few years to get more and more birth centers to help out the midwives um, that are struggling with keeping up with home birth practices, maybe opening freestanding birth centers with open models that other midwives can have privileges at. I do see a huge influx in freestanding birth centers the next few years. So there's a lot of things to think about with CABC, AABC, what is the definition of a freestanding birth center? There are very specific evidence-based quality standards, key indicators that CABC has put into place. Whether you want to do the accreditation process or not, depending on your state requirements, it's a good idea to know those indicators and set it up to national standards. Maybe in the first year the budgets don't fit to do this, the accreditation and you're in a state where there's no birth center regulations and it doesn't make financial sense at this point. You can still set up everything. They give you those tools and templates very very publicly so you can learn and grow and gradually get to a state licensure or a certification. I'm going to stress if it's a state that requires licensure, you can't open a birth center in that state without having the licensure. If there's no birth center regulations, it's much more vague and ambiguous of the, the being able to have a birth center in that state.